scripture for us, and at the end, we will all res respond with, uh, thanks be to God. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, friends, uh, I'm excited to share with you this morning. Um, I think there's been a lot of things that um, God has been teaching me over the sabbatical and uh, things that um, I I've been learning myself. And I, I just wanted to take a moment. I know we prayed just a moment ago. Um, but but I, I think that a message like this and uh, some of the messages that we're going to get uh, in the future, um, sometimes I, I think we, we like kind of like think we already know it. And, and, and so it, it sort of like doesn't really impact us. And what, what I want to pray is that um, we can just be open to whatever God wants to speak. And uh, I'm going to try to be as open and honest with you. And, and I, I confessed this to the praise team before that um, if I shared everything I wanted to share, um, the sermon would be like three hours. Don't worry. It's not going to be three hours. <laughs> not this time. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that um, I, I'm kind of nervous because I, I'm not sure that, that I'm going to be able to do justice to this passage and, you know, what, what God is trying to communicate to us. So if you could pray for me, too, uh, that, that the message will be clear. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to be as honest as possible with you all. So um, if you could just pray with me for a moment. God, we believe in your living spirit, and we know, God, that you are active and working in this place, and you are working in the word that we just received and in the preaching of your word this morning, uh, this afternoon. And I know, God, this time of day, sometimes it is difficult for us to focus, God. But we pray for more than anything, God, for an openness, God, to your spirit and what you want to uh, uh, say to us, God. And if any of us, Lord, feel uh, that tendency to think that this message is for someone else, God, may you show us, Lord, what you want to reveal in ourselves and how you want to speak to us this morning, and may you use your servant, God, that your word may be clear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I wanted to share with you, uh, I know I mentioned last week um, that the reason why I took this five-month sabbatical that I just got off from a couple weeks ago uh, was because I was very, very burnt out. And so one of the questions that most people would ask me uh, after the sabbatical, uh, if, if you happen to see me during the sabbatical, it's a very natural question. I would ask the same question if I met a pastor on sabbatical. Um, and they would ask me, what did you do? Or what are you doing, right? And I would always answer the same way. I would say, nothing. And most of the time, people would, would be like, good, you know? And is it good? I don't know. But <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, I mentioned that uh, a lot of people during their sabbatical, they, they go places and things like that. And uh, I was just so burned out. I just wanted to get to the sabbatical, kind of figure it out. But one of the things that I realized when I got to the sabbatical is that there's just a lot of stuff in my heart, a lot of things that maybe shouldn't be there. And even as I've been serving as a pastor, there's always kind of like, these things warring within me, you know, like competing motivations and desires, you know. On the one hand, I do believe the things that I'm preaching and the things that I'm talking about, and I want to do it to glorify God. And of course, I know the right things to say, right? I've been doing this for a long time. Like, it's, it's only for God's glory, right? It's not about me. 
but I'm there too, right? And there are times where, uh, for me, I, I'm a pretty big people pleaser. Like, like there's this story, and, and I mentioned last week uh, a little bit about my story, that I faced a lot of rejection. Uh, I was kind of like the last kid, kid picked at dodgeball always, you know? I always felt like the outsider, you know? And there's this part where this rejection, it, it kind of like goes with me everywhere. And so I'm always like trying to like, you know, make sure that, that people like what I say and people like me, you know? And no matter how hard I try to like take that out, it's like there, right? And it's also like, you know, why am I doing the things that I'm doing? Why am I a pastor? Am I doing it because I truly love the Lord or am I doing it because I feel like I have to or, you know, it's become a job or, you know, that, that people have this expectation of me, you know? Like, do I pray? Do I read the Bible? Do I do any of this stuff? Do I go to church because I really love the Lord or because, you know, my, my parents made me go to church and I, I feel like if I don't go to church, like I'm a bad person, you know? And so there's this part of me that just wanted to like rip all this stuff out. And I had this desire to just kind of like do nothing during this break. And, you, you know, th there's like these competing things. Like I wanted to get rid of those wrong motivations, but also there's something appealing about doing nothing. Um, I watched this movie when I was in college, uh, late, late 90s, it's called Office Space. If any of you have ever seen this, it's about a guy who's a, a software programmer and he hates his job. He, he just finds that like there's no joy in it. His boss is terrible to him. Uh, he, he just feels like every day is worse than the day that came before. And so every day of his life is the worst day of his life, you know? And so he's just miserable. And so he's talking to a friend one day and, and you know, they ask this question to each other, what would you do if you had a million dollars? Now, this was like late 90s, so maybe now with inflation it has to be, what would you do with a billion dollars? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, so like this guy, this, this disgruntled software uh, uh, programmer, his answer was, I would do nothing. If I was rich, I had all the money in the world that I ever needed, I would do absolutely nothing. And brothers and sisters, I resonate with that. And I had this opportunity for five months to do that. I'm not rich, right? I don't have a million, billion dollars, right? But I had this opportunity to do nothing. And so for about two months, I pretty much did nothing. And again, there's this part of me that's like, okay, I don't want to do these things because, just because I'm a pastor. And so I started doing this thing. It was kind of like, I don't know if it was conscious. At some point, it became very conscious, where I was like, I'm not going to do anything because I feel bad, right? Like, I'm not going to read the Bible because I feel bad that I didn't read the Bible. By the way, I'm not sure that I recommend this to anyone. I'm just saying what I did, okay? So don't take this as like, well, I, Pastor Steve's example, right? Like, we're just going to do nothing, you know? But this is just what I happened to do. And you'll see by the end of the story, it wasn't necessarily good, okay? <laughs> but I, I was like, okay, if I don't feel like reading the Bible, I'm not going to read the Bible. If I don't feel like praying, I'm not going to pray, you know? Especially if it makes me feel bad, you know? So I didn't go to LGM, even though I was local, I didn't go to LGM during that five-month break, but I did go to a local church that's actually not far from here. But there were times, especially in that first couple months, where if I felt bad about not going to church, well, I wouldn't go to church. And so this is happening, and there's this myth, there's this idea, friends. Um, it, it's, it's actually here where it talks about this idea of freedom, like, like we're called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. And I have to say that I was pretty much doing that, right? We have this myth in, in, in America, I think especially, is that if you can do whatever you want, whenever you want to do it, you will be happy. And so in many ways, I put this to the test. Now, I didn't commit any crimes, right? I didn't do anything like that. But I, I just like played a lot of video games and I watched a lot of movies and, you know, like just during the day, like if I wanted to take a nap, I'd take a nap, you know? 
And I just wouldn't do that much. Lots of scrolling, lots of doom scrolling, lots of puppy videos, right? And a couple months of this, and I'm not happy. I mean, maybe this will not come as a big surprise to you. And friends, by the way, I'm 47 years old. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor here for 20 years. I know the right answer. I know that doing whatever you want, whenever you want to do it, will not make you happy. Of course I know that. But there's like a tiny part of me, right? That's like, yeah, but, you know, isn't that what everyone's chasing? To just be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want to do it? Maybe it will make me happy. Maybe I'll try that for a little bit. And at the end of the two months, I got to tell you, I was probably lonelier than I've ever been because I wasn't you know, going to church. I wasn't in community with people. And I was pretty darn depressed. There was something happening within me that was like tearing me apart. And, and it starts to kind of hint at this here. So it says, you know, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. You have been created for something, to do something. Not to do nothing, by the way. <laughs> for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Now, it's talking about like our desires, like we can sort of like devour other people, right? But I wonder if also our desires are kind of devouring us too. So this is in Philippians 3, 18 through 21. For as I have often told you before, now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. I find that phrase so visceral and so descriptive. Their God is their stomach. Think about that, friends. Isn't that the way that most people live? Their God is their stomach. Just whatever appetite you have, whatever desire you have, whatever you want, that's what is leading you. That's what you follow. That's what you worship. You feel like you have to do it, right? And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. My question is, when does that happen? When does that happen? Does that happen when we finally go to heaven and get to be with Jesus? Maybe. Is that supposed to happen here? Did it happen the moment that you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? For me, that's when I was 12 years old. I went to this camp in Ohio. It's called Camp Wanakee. And I accepted the Lord Jesus into my life. 12 years old, little Steve, right? And then ever since then, I have had no problems. My lowly body was transformed into a glorious body, right? Right? Has that been your experience? Because this is the thing, right? I'm 47 years, 47 years old, right? You, you can do the math, right? I became a Christian when I was 12, 35 years of being a Christian. And I'm sitting here during my sabbatical two months in, and I'm looking at the mirror, and I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do what? There's this war, this battle. It is eating me alive, right? And, and, and like in some sense, I feel like I should be happy, right? Like, like I have no reason to complain, but I'm not. I'm miserable. Friends, I don't know, you know, where you've been in life and if there are times where you feel like this, that the answers that this world is giving you, I know if you grew up in the church, you're supposed to say this. You're supposed to say it doesn't satisfy. The world doesn't satisfy. But I want to ask you, person to person, human to human, is that actually true or not? And I have to say, for me, I find this world and the pleasures that it offers very, very disappointing. When we get to do whatever we want, you know, let's say, like, you know what, I just want to stay home and I just want to binge Korean dramas all day long. Would that make you happy? 
Maybe there's a part of you that you're like, well, Pastor Steve, it's better than organic chemistry, right? It's better than my job, right? But if you actually do it, does it make you happy? Does it give you what you think that it's going to give you, right? And so I shared this last week that I started to kind of snap out because I, I was at like a pretty low point. This is like two months in, and I'm like, okay, this isn't working. I'm not happy. I'm depressed. I, I don't even know if I want to be here anymore. Like, like, it's not like I was like suicidal, but it's like, I just don't want to do this. Do you ever feel like that? I just want to like escape from myself, you know? And, and, and the, the, the sort of solution that I came up with wasn't like a big solution because I was like, man, there's just so many issues that I have. And, and by the way, when I started to kind of like face what was going on, I realized that I had so much hurt. And, and I, I can't really fully get into it. It's not so much that people at church hurt me, that it was their fault, that they did it intentionally. But I already told you, I'm a people pleaser, right? I want people to like me. You know, I'm very sensitive to rejection, even when I, like, people aren't rejecting me, but I feel like I'm being rejected. And so whatever it was, whether people really were rejecting me, it felt like I was being rejected. And so I'm sitting there, and, um, you know, I have to face all of this. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, like, how do I do this? How do I get better, you know? And the one thing that I did, uh, I shared this last week, was I went to the park because I was like, okay, what's something that like worked? You know, the park is where I would spend time with the Lord. So I went to the park and started, you know, listening to music and listening to audiobooks. And I came across this one audiobook and I listened to something that just, something clicked. I, I just like realized something and it was like the fog was lifted. And I was like, oh, that's why. I, I've kind of like somewhat jokingly been telling people like during the break, I figured out what's wrong with humans. And, and that sounds so pompous to say that, you know, but in some ways I, I, I felt like I did. I felt like what was wrong with me, that something clicked. Um, I was reading this book called The Righteous Mind. It's by Jonathan Haidt, who is a, um, he's an author and he's a social uh, psychologist uh, he's written a number of books, and he talks about this concept in The Righteous Mind that actually originated in this book. This is, this, this is the, um, if you're going to read one of his books, I, I would start with this one, uh, The Happiness Hypothesis. And he talks about what human nature is actually like. Have you ever thought about this? What is human nature actually like? There is a theory that we've had in the West that I think is actually incorrect. It is that you are essentially a mind, right? You're a brain that basically like has thoughts and your thoughts control everything. So then you have emotions, right? And actions that all come from your thoughts, right? By the way, we were very influenced by like machines and then later computers and robots, right? This idea that your brain is like the central processing unit of your computer. Right? And so it makes everything else happen. And so then whatever thought you have, that will produce an emotion. So if you think a happy thought, then you will feel a happy emotion. Right? And by the way, this is very influenced by our uh, uh, belief in freedom. Like we are these free people. And so we can change our lives by thinking our way to a better life. Right? So you just have to think of, of a better solution. Right? If you're sad, Stop thinking sad thoughts. Okay, brothers and sisters, I'm not going to make, make you raise your hand, but I know it's not just me. I would raise my hand to this question. How many of you have struggled with depression? Don't raise your hand. But I know it would be more than just me. Has that advice done anything for you? Stop thinking sad thoughts? Are you kidding me? Right? Are you kidding me? Like if you're anxious and someone was like, well, stop thinking anxious thoughts. Right? You'd be like, I'm going to punch you in your face right now. Are you kidding? If it was that simple, I would stop doing it. That's not how human beings are constructed. That's not how human nature works. And so what Jonathan Haidt said is that um, he originally had this, this, this thought like, like, okay, like our rationality, it's like a writer. And then the rest of you 
there's this part that you can't fully control, but you're trying to guide it. And at first he started with a horse. He's like, it's like a horse and a rider. But he ended up settling on a different animal. I wanna share this with you. This is from uh, my brother Daniel, Daniel Tan. Uh, he went to Malaysia this summer and he brought back these beautiful ornate elephants. And uh, so uh, when, when I saw this, uh, uh, I was like, I'm gonna share this when I talk about the, the, this, this idea. What Jonathan Haidt said is that it's not really a horse, it's more like an elephant. Some of you may have actually heard this uh, analysis, and I wanna share with you my understanding of it, because honestly, I've read a lot of stuff about the rider and the elephant. I've seen a lot of YouTube videos, and I don't think they fully represent what Jonathan Haidt was trying to say, because they basically say, the rider is your reason, and the elephant is your emotion. And it's actually a little more nuanced than that. So I, I wanna share with you what Jonathan Haidt says. So he says that basically your rider is the rational mind. That's the conscious part of you that makes those decisions and thinks thoughts and figures things out. Right, But the elephant is that emotional part of you, but it's more than that. It's something very instinctive, intuitive, and it's mostly automatic processes. This is the important part. You are not in complete control. There are times where the rider and the elephant are perfectly in sync, right? So I don't know, like maybe you're like, I really want a cheeseburger, and the elephant's like, me too. And you go and you get a cheeseburger. Right, but what if, what if you're like, I want to lose weight, I don't be, I want to be healthy, I don't want to eat a cheese big burger, but your elephant is like, cheeseburger, ooh, what happens then? There's a battle, right? Which one is stronger? Which one is stronger, friends? Which one is stronger? If you look at this world and all the people who are trying to diet. <laughs> <laughs> right? I can tell you, right? I don't think it's a big mystery. The elephant is stronger, right? The elephant is way stronger. And so this is the thing, friends. Have you ever wondered why we do things sometimes that are not good for us? Elephants. Have you ever wondered why you could have a very rational argument with someone? Have you ever tried to, in, uh, like, argue with somebody about, like, I don't know, something that people are emotional about? religion, politics. And have you ever been like, dude, I crushed that argument. I dismantled all their reasons. Now they should convert to Christianity. Now they should convert to my political party and vote for my candidate. Have you ever felt that way? Did they? Did they convert? <laughs> Did all of your reasoning convince them? No, you know why? Because the writer isn't truly in control. It's not reasoning that's controlling. It's the elephant. What is the elephant? It's all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, right? It is your emotions, but it's like your previous experiences that have shaped who you are, where you automatically do certain things, right? Some of you, like you go through your day and do you ever do something where you're like, you have this moment of clarity where you're like, why did I do that? I didn't want to do that. You know why? Elephant, right? Now, the Bible has a way of talking about the writer and the elephant. It's a little bit different. Now, I, I, wanted, I wanted to go with the elephant first before we went to the Bible because many of us have heard this already. And you think you know what this means, but because of, you know, our familiarity with the Bible and with these types of concepts, we think we know what it is and we dismiss it. We're like, yeah, we're done with that. Or, you know, that's not that big a deal. But I wanted to share the elephant and the writer thing first because I think a lot will make more sense when you see the Bible talking about the exact same thing. And what the Bible talks about is spirit versus flesh. Now we're gonna talk about two kinds of spirit here, okay? So you guys know that we are made in the image of God, right? Right? And so you have flesh just like every animal. Every animal has instinctive things that it does, right? When an animal wants to eat, it eats. When it wants to play, it plays. When it wants to, to bask in the sun, it basks in the sun. And there's these automatic processes that are just leading it wherever it wants to go, right? But you have been given something that the animals don't have. 
you have been given a spirit that is similar to the spirit of God. You remember that? We were clay and then God breathed into us. We were given a spirit like the spirit of God. But what happened when we sinned? What happened, brothers and sisters? We broke that connection with the spirit of God. So now you have a rogue spirit, right? That is trying to live a good life, trying to do the right thing, but you have broken the connection with the main spirit, the spirit of God. So when you see spirit with a small s, when I use it, you're gonna know that I'm talking about your spirit. What is your spirit? It is your will. It is your conscious decision to do this or don't do that, right? When you're like, I really wanna pray. I really want to forgive this person, right? I really want to, you know, go to church, right? That's your will. Then you have this flesh. And so I, I just copied and pasted this from the NIV. This is the footnote that is put whenever it talks about flesh. In context like this, the Greek word for flesh, sarx, refers to the sinful state of human beings often presented as a power in opposition to the spirit. So the flesh is that system, right? And we're not just talking about the body. We're not talking about this flesh, right? We're not talking about skin, okay? This is where people get confused. They're like, body bad, spirit good. No, man, it's all good, but it has been maybe corrupted, right? And so there is this idea that you may have a spirit that's like, okay, I want to pray, I want to read the Bible, I want to forgive people, I want to love people, but then you have this flesh that's like, I'm kind of tired, right? You know, oh, I don't want to forgive that person, that person's a jerk. Oh, it's going to be so uncomfortable if I go talk to them, right? Like, oh, the Bible's so boring. Oh, I don't feel like praying, I, I'm so busy, right? Right? It's all of that stuff that you didn't necessarily consciously be like, how can I get out of praying? It just happens. It's automatic. It is happening to all of us, right? And so when we look at, um, uh, by the way, th th there's a third thing that people add. Jonathan Haidt doesn't talk this much about it, but people love talking about the third one because this is why a lot of the stuff you look about the elephant and the writer is not great because what they're trying to do is they're trying to manipulate the elephant and the writer, right? So they like talking about the path. I just want to talk about it because if you look it up, you'll see everyone talks about the elephant and the writer and the path. And the path is your external environment. And so they're like, oh, all you got to do is make the path so the elephant has to do what you want, right? So you can manipulate it, right? And you'll have lots of sales and you'll be very successful in life, right? I do think there is a path and I do think that there were times where God even tried to use certain things to curb the elephant like the law right? And, and so th there were certain things that I think we use to try to curb the elephant. And we're going to talk about the best way, the best path that's going to help you. But we're not going to talk about a lot today because we have a lot to cover. We've already covered a lot. But I'm just going to throw it out there. Just, just lob it up there and we'll, we'll come back to it later. It is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, and I'm not talking about heaven after you die, but living in a place in a reality where God is ruling and you don't need to be afraid, that's the right kind of path where this elephant can maybe come to heal, right? But this is what it says in scripture. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do whatever you want, right? So that's what's happening, friends. That it's actually not good. We've already seen. If you do whatever you want by your flesh, it's not going to be good. It leads to destruction one way or another. It does not lead to the flourishing life. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So we, at one time, had constraints. God had to do it because he knew we were led by our flesh. This is before Jesus came, before the Holy Spirit was was you know, unleashed in, in a very wide way, very accessible way. And so that in many ways, we needed something to constrain us, right? To keep us in line. So we had the law. But now that Jesus has come, right? If we are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, so friends, 
What is that telling us? I already told you, right, that we have flesh and we have our spirit. And, and just look at that picture. Look at the size of the elephant to the rider, right? We already said, right, if the elephant wants to do what it wants, it's much, much bigger. I mean, on this thing, we would be like a tiny Lego figure, right? We would be so small, right? But that is spirit with a small s, right? That's our spirit, right? Our fallen spirit, right? And we need to hook up with something stronger. I couldn't find any picture because this is like, you know, my own kind of interpretation of this whole thing. So you have to uh, uh, just, you know, excuse my very poor um, <laughs> graphic skills. But uh, so we need a stronger spirit, okay? Look at that, the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit, I didn't draw that, I just found a clip art. But, you know, so the Holy Spirit is much, much stronger, much, much bigger. Compared to the Holy Spirit, the elephant is kind of puny, right? So what we got to do is we got to link up our spirit, right? We got to tag team in the Holy Spirit. Have you seen, right, like where it talks about this in Scripture? Even says things like, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. You've been drugged by this elephant. This elephant is stomping you, right? Come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. What does that mean? Link up your life to mine. Link up your spirit to my Holy Spirit. And now we are cooking with gas. Now we can start going in the direction that the Holy Spirit, that God wants us to go, right? So friends, um, well, well, we'll skip this. We'll come back to James 4 one time, uh, sometime, but it's just to show, it talks about the, this concept all over the place. I'm not just making this up. I'm not just cherry picking, right? It's all over scripture, right? And so friends, um, it, it has this list that if you don't understand what we're talking about here, this sounds like more law. This sounds like we're just saying like, don't do this, right? But I think you understand right now, if you're led by the flesh, in some ways, you can't help it. You may not do everything on the list. I doubt everyone in this room does everything on this list, right? But it's just saying, right? If you are led by the flesh, the acts of the flesh, it's gonna be obvious, right? We know where this is going, right? But maybe for us in 2024, as Christians, we need to be reminded where these things are going, right? Because we, we have this myth and we live in this secular society where everyone's telling you how great it's going to be if you are free. Just do whatever you want to do. Do what makes you happy. If you do what makes you happy, the funny thing is it doesn't make you happy. It leads to this. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, we have viewed this wrongly, I think. I think we have looked at this and said, oh, Stop doing it, right? Which again, how, how is that going to work? Elephant, stop it, right? The rider's like yelling at the elephant and it doesn't work, right? And by the way, friends, this is another thing. We're going to get more into this. This elephant is so powerful and so sneaky that it loves to make you think that you're in control. This is one of the things that the elephant loves to do is I really want to do this. Okay, I'm going to use this example. Sorry if this hits too close to home for some people. Have you ever wanted to date someone that your rider was like, mm, bad idea, don't date that person. But your elephant is like, but I want to. Just the way they make me feel, right? And so what do you do? You're like, well, I really want to date them. But all your friends are like, mm, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a bad idea, right? So what, do you do? What, is, what is an elephant to do? An elephant that really wants what it wants. It's like, writer, this is what we're going to do. We're going to come up with reasons, okay? So we're gonna, I'm going to convince you that you're the one who decided that this was a good idea. So the writer's like, oh, okay, well, you know, 
they're, they're really mean to people, but it's because they're so passionate. I love that. They're in, in independent spirit. And the elephant's like, good job, writer. Good job, right? And so all the time, the writer is sometimes doing things, but they're doing them blindly because they don't really understand who's in charge. I, I want to just show you one small thing, okay? And so please, friends, I, 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 I promise you, I'm no better than any of you. But I want to ask you a question. If you guys believe in Jesus and uh, you, you know that Jesus died for your sins, we are forgiven. Amen? Amen? So this is, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. But I want to ask you, when you read this list, what are the things that your eyes are drawn to? What are the ones that you pay the most attention to? Are they the ones that actually have nothing to do with you? The ones that you do not struggle with. By the way, there's some that were very common in that time. So Paul is talking to a first century audience. And he's like, they're obvious, like witchcraft. And people are like, oh, yeah, 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 witchcraft, right? Have you, do you know people doing witchcraft nowadays, <laughs> right? But our eyes are drawn to certain things that we are not struggling with, right? We're like, well, I'm not doing that one. I'm not doing that one. I'm not doing that one. What about envy? What about selfish ambition? What about jealousy? What about hatred? What about discord? There are a lot of Christians walking around, and we are like, I hate that person. But you know what? It's a holy hatred. You know, I, I'm, I'm really angry right now, but it's a righteous anger. You know, I, I'm, I'm really jealous, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it, that, that's just understandable. Everyone gets jealous, right? And in many ways, friends, we are blind, right? And so that's why sometimes it's important for us to look at the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law, right? That this is what gets produced when you are led by the Spirit of God, right? And so we have to do this gut check question. Is your life producing this? Well, some of us, I mean, I think all of us are like, well, sometimes, but sometimes it's not. And if it's sometimes not, friends, I think we still have an elephant problem, right? And so we are told, um, well, well uh, let, let me, we'll go back to the rest of that scripture real quick. But real quick, I, I know we've gone quite long. I, I just think that, I, like, we'll spend a lot more time with this. But I want to give you a few very practical things, okay? Just as we go, just for things just, you know, we're going to go through real quick but just for you to chew on as we go into the coming weeks. Um, how do we live by the Spirit? I, I put this as uh, zero, right? Because uh, there are ways that we can live by the Spirit, but this is how we get in the door. This is how we get started. Do you want to live by the Spirit? Do you want lo more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control in your life? Are you sick of living by the flesh. Almost every saint that I've ever seen, every story that I've ever heard, it starts with somebody whose life gets wrecked by the elephant. Somebody who's just like, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this. I don't want this anymore. But there are many of us, friends, who haven't gotten to that point. And so if you're not at that point, it's okay. Don't worry, right? God is still good. He's still working in your life. It'll work itself out. Don't worry. We'll get there, right? But if you are sick of the elephant, as I was sick of the elephant, then this next part is for you, okay? First thing you can do is learn to stop listening to and believing your flesh. You, you got to just realize that the elephant doesn't know what it's talking about, right? And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that your emotions uh, get kicked up by this elephant, and sometimes they're just... I'm sorry for saying it like this. They're full of crap. They seriously don't know what they're talking about, right? Let me give you an example. Have you ever, like, just been, like, really, like, joyful? And you're just like, oh, my gosh, like, like I have, like, such good friends and good family. 
and life is good, and all of a sudden a thought comes with an emotion that's like, but what if they all die? <laughs> or what if something terrible, what if I lose my job, right? Has that ever happened to you? What is that? What is that? Is that based in any reality? Or is that just the elephant doing elephant things? Why does it do that? I don't know. I mean, that, that's for someone who uh, knows psychi psychology better than me, right? But all I know is that, yo, why, like, like, so you could just be like, okay, that's weird. That's a weird thought. I'm going to just enjoy the moment. Or you could start listening to the elephant, like, oh my gosh, maybe I, I will lose everything, ah, right? And then all of a sudden, you're following the elephant, right? Have you ever just been like, I don't know, like you wake up in the morning and you feel anxious? There's no reason to feel anxious, you just feel anxious. It's like your body is remembering something. That's the elephant doing elephant things. Don't believe it. Oh, maybe there's a reason why I'm anxious, right? That's what a lot of us do. We believe it, we listen to it, then we follow it, right? Just note it, right? And you're gonna feel strongly and it's hard not to follow it. Uh, which is why God gives us some help, right? What we need to learn how to do is to crucify the flesh. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is learning to sacrifice, surrender your passions, your desires, your leanings to the spirit of Christ who is always there with you, right? And friends, we'll talk more about this, but there is this sense in which Crucifixion doesn't feel good, right? Dying to these things doesn't always feel good. It means you're going to have to experience them. Did Jesus, when he was on the cross, did he like not experience the pain? Of course he felt it, right? But what a lot of our elephants do is they're like, okay, let's not feel this pain. You have an uncomfortable thought? Don't worry, I got you. Let's go to Instagram. Let's go drink. Let's go fall asleep. Right? Let's go do something fun. Let's go eat a tub of ice cream. Right? And we're like, yeah, you're right. I don't want to experience this. But if you can sit with it, if you can give it to God without listening to it, you're like, okay, this is full of crap, but I'm experiencing this. I'm anxious. Oh, I am sad. Oh, I am disappointed. If you allow that to die within yourself by the spirit of Christ, it can be overcome. Third thing, last thing, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. There is a very, very insidious thing that happens to the people of God, is that we think that we are over these elephants because we have Christ. And it makes us very arrogant and conceited. We're like, ah, I'm better than you. Now I gotta teach all these other poor saps who are being led by the flesh. Right? But I, I know better. I'm better. Right? And it's a way of your elephant, again, fooling you. Right? Friends, we can avoid a lot of this if we can sync our spirit with the spirit of Christ. What it talks about living and keeping in step with the spirit. And it starts with incredible humility and gratitude. Look at the life of Jesus. Did Jesus come in and be like, guys, I'm just so much better than you. <laughs> Look at you all. He's like judging them and all this. No, he came to be with them. It's radical humility. Jesus would even say things like, why do you call me good? There's only one who's good, right? And when you realize, friends, that I am no better than anyone else with their elephant, I still struggle with this, right? But we are fellow strugglers. That It changes the way you view other people. You can't judge them anymore, right? But it puts you in a place where the spirit can then work in your life. Because you know you need help. You know you need a savior. I want to just close real quick with, um, there's a hymn that um, has become a favorite of mine. And it's called, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And the, 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 the last verse is, is, is what I want to kind of focus on. Praise him, you guys can come up and set up here. Um, it goes, oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. So friends, this is a Christian. This is a Christ follower. His heart is still wandering. Their heart is still wandering like mine, right? 
And this is the part that I, I want us to focus on. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. When we give our heart, our spirit to Christ, when we give these things to Christ, that's when the Holy Spirit can come in and really do some things. He wants to seal your heart for his. And it's going to be a continual process. It might be day by day, friends. We're all prone to wander. But there is help coming. That, that's the song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. You got to go to that source every day. So before we sing the hymn, can we just go, come before Christ right now? Friends, I don't know what you're feeling. Maybe some of you are feeling shame. You're feeling guilt. Friends, can I uh, just suggest to you that's the elephant doing elephant things? Don't believe it. Don't follow it. Don't listen to it. Just acknowledge it. You can just accept it. And let's give that to Christ right now. Whatever you are feeling, let's give our very hearts. Let's give... I don't know, maybe some of you are like, yeah, Pastor Steve, I'm with you. I'm sick of living according to the flesh. Oh, man, I'm so sick and tired. Can you just bring that before God? He wants to seal you for the courts abo uh, above. Friends, I got to tell you, I seriously, I believe this 1,000%. I've seen it in my life. The elephant gets weaker as the spirit of Christ within you gets stronger. The elephant gets weaker as the spirit of Christ within you gets stronger. And you are able to experience that love. You are able to experience that peace and that joy and all of the things that God promises you. It is so wonderful. So let's come and let's lay down our hearts before God. Let's just kind of confess, friends. Where are you? Have elephants been leading? Have they been wreaking havoc in your life? Bring that to Christ right now. Let's pray. God, we just want to lay down before you, God. We confess, God, that we are led by things that are not of you. So often, God, we war with these things. But Lord, we ask, we pray, God, that you may lead. Holy Spirit, come and lead. We need you. Precious God, we need you, Lord. Jesus, come. Lord, we don't want to live according to the flesh anymore. Jesus, we just acknowledge, God, that it's there. We're just honest, Lord, to say, God, that we're not always in charge, God. We like to believe, God, that our spirits are strong enough, God, to fight them. But, Lord, we know that there's only one spirit that is truly strong enough. It is your spirit. So, God, we come to submit and surrender again. We need you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we need you. Friends, let's rise and let's sing this hymn together.